Good afternoon and welcome to the June 2021 meeting of the Houston County Historical Society. This is a joint meeting with our neighbors and parent county, uh, Stewart County. Welcome to our Stewart County friends. We've not had a meeting since February of 2020, so don't think you've missed anything. <laughs> Uh, please be sure and sign in if you haven't already. We'd just like to get a new account. And Alan, if you would lead us in the pledge, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. In our checking account, we have $3,113. We have a CD with $11,319 in change. Um, recently, we've had some, a little bit of income. We sold some books at the archives. Has had some visitors and sold some books for a total of $130. This is just for the last couple of months. Um, and expenses were our annual report that we do to the state of Tennessee and our insurance of $436. Okay, is there a motion to accept the treasure? So Alan, is there a second? second. All in favor? Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, you may notice Leah as our new treasurer. Uh, we had a, an emergency meeting in December of 2020 because we have, we lost our uh, treasurer. Leah agreed to take that treasurer position. Uh, we had a couple of people who were unable to continue to be our board of directors. So our new board of directors uh, will be Kay French and Rodney Lowe and Mitchell Smithy. Uh, by Robert's Rules of Orders, the board member vacancies can be appointed by the officers and board until such time as the entire society can meet in person then there will be an election and all society members can vote. Is there a motion to accept our new members? Uh, I mean, our, okay. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Uh, uh, we were also discussing the dues, and since we only had two meetings last year, um, there was a motion, or needs to be a motion made, made that um, we don't charge any dues this year. If you paid last year, don't worry about it this year. If you've not paid last year and want to, uh, the dues are $10 a year or $50 for a lifetime membership per household. Uh, Alyssa, would you like to uh, talk about the archives? Yes. So good to see everybody again. Um, it's been like a year and a half since I talked about the archives. I've had a lot going on. Um, I can tell you that when COVID started, I, I was sitting home for three weeks from the archives to work from home. After that, I've been in the archives every day. So, except for when I had COVID over Christmas. But, um, so we've been working very diligently. Uh, we have had a lot of people donate a lot of stuff. I think during COVID, everybody was cleaning out their closets and garages and attics and so we're very thankful we got a lot of donations um the ut extension office actually cleaned out their offices as well and they gave us about four boxes of photo slides from 4-h beef contests agricultural extension activities and so that's something that at some point we're going to want to transfer over i've looked at some of them just up in the light they're really, really, really great. Um, and just recently, Robert Brown, the county court clerk, gave us um, the old will books, dating back to 1871 up to 1966. And if anyone knows Robert Brown, that's a miracle. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what's, the, what's the years of the UT? 
I want to say those slides, from what I can tell, probably go back to the 70s, 1970s. We might find some, some that's older, but yeah, um, they're going to be a fantastic and wonderful thing. Also, we were able to obtain a Tennessee State Library and Archives grant for $5,000, and with that grant, we hired a part-time project archivist, uh, and so Leah was our project archivist. She worked on our court records. Um, she actually was reboxing a lot of these records because we started out the archives 10 years ago. We're actually celebrating our 10th anniversary this year. Um, and we used some boxes that were kind of big, and so these were really heavy, and so we reboxed them into smaller boxes so they're easy to handle when we want to get them off a shelf. She also completed the Circuit Court Criminal Index that dates up, up to 1990, 1871 to 1990. And the Chancery Court Index has been completed up to 1980. Uh, and like I said, she's reboxed a lot of records. And she's currently working on the loose marriage records and some other projects. And so it's been fantastic to have her uh, for six months. Uh, she was already volunteering and she's going to continue to volunteer but um, we really got some fantastic work done during that time um, i can also report to you that hopefully as of june 21st if the full county commission passes this year's budget you will have a full-time archivist yeah. um, like i said we're celebrating um, November 15th of 2020 was our 10 years of being in archive, archives. February 1st was my 10 years of being the archivist. And so it's only taken 10 years to get part or get full time. <laughs> uh, but we're still waiting. I haven't um, started celebrating yet. It's got to be passed by the full commission. The budget committee has passed the full budget with that. And so I'm hoping that on June 21st it will be passed. Um, I do have a couple of projects in the archives that I'm wanting to do, and I'm hoping that some of you will be able to want to help. First, um, we had a meeting. I had a meeting with um, um, I don't know what's his name. Zach Kinslow. He is the director of the Clement Museum in Dixon. Uh, several of the historical society members were there as well. Um, my husband and I had actually gone to the museum, gone through the museum. And we realized that Lucille Christensen Clement, who was a native of Houston County, and the wife of Governor Frank Clement, um, was sorely uh, underrepresented at the museum. Uh, I think I saw one or two pictures in his office. They set up as his office. Other than that, you didn't see her much. So I reached out to uh, Zach, who's the new director, and suggested that the archives and the museum kind of come together and we put together a, um, a temporary exhibit on Lucille Christensen. And he came down to the archives, looked at the materials that we had, and thought it would be a fantastic idea. And so they've already got some of their exhibits already planned, so we're kind of tentatively looking at November, but don't hold your breath on that, but we're, we're going to do it sometime in the future. Um, but while I was getting those materials together to show him, I read a newspaper article from 1957 where Lucille was there, uh, there to, uh, and Frank was there to um, dedicate the new courthouse. And they dedicated the courthouse and they made it Lucille Day. And so I did not realize that we had a Lucille Day in Houston County. Um, and so I wanted to bring that back. Um, and so sometime in November, the, that was November 7th, I want to have Lucille Day in the archives, and so look for that to come. Also, we got a donation of some memorabilia for Rachel Maddox. How many of you do not know who Rachel Maddox is? Jim. <laughs> Rachel Maddox was a very well-known author in Houston County. Um, one of her books, I think two of her books were made into movies. One of them was A Walk in the Spring Rain, which starred Ingrid Bergman and Anthony, Anthony Quinn. And I just recently found out that it was filmed at Cades Cove in East Tennessee. So he had donated an um, original book, some newspaper uh, articles, and a letter that she had written him in 1970. And this is a Bill Williams. I don't know if anyone knows a Bill Williams. He actually worked for Columbia Records. His mother lived here. And he was able to get the soundtrack from the movie 
for Rachel, and she had written him a letter thanking him for getting the soundtrack for her. So I have that letter. But then I realized, after talking to Kay French about this, that there used to be a Rachel Maddox Day, and they used to celebrate it at the library. So that was also in November. So look for us probably to have a Rachel Maddox Day to come back as well. Um, the next project, and this is where I'm going to need those of you who are been around a long time, help. One of the things that is during the COVID that we've noticed in the archives is that we have a lot of photographs, thankfully, but we have a lot of photographs that are unidentified. And so I've been talking to Donald and some other people about a project whereas I put together some photographs um, and we're going to put um, a sheet with each photograph where you can identify people, places, events, whatever you can figure out from the photograph. Now this is not something you'll need to come to the archives and do. I find that a lot of people don't want to come sit in an archives. So what we're going to do is I'm going to put together a packet of 10 photographs. If you sign up to do this project, you will come get your 10 photographs, take them home, and at your leisure, you're going to fill out this form and look at the photograph, try to figure out who the people are, where it was taken, Maybe identify the cars. I find that men like to tell me what your car is in the photograph. Anything that you can figure out about the photograph. And then you bring those 10 photographs back to the archives. I give you 10 more photographs. And so I have a sign-in sheet. So after the meeting, if you want to sign up to do this project, um, we will do that. Um, let's see. Over here on this table, because of our 150th birthday as a county, Donald and Jackie Bateman worked tirelessly to reach out to our officials, all the way up to the U.S. Senate level, and they sent proclamations and congratulations to us. And these are on display at the archives, but I brought them here tonight, so please look at those. We have one from Governor Lee, Senator Mark Green, uh, Marsha Blackburn, uh, so please look at those sometime tonight. Um, also over there, um, the Chamber of Commerce with Irish Day, um, we have a new county logo. And so they bought materials, there's coffee cups, there's tumblers, there's hats, there's koozies. And these are for sale tonight if you'd like to purchase one. And the money goes to the Chamber of Commerce. And so afterwards, um, I'll take that money if you want to do that. Um, other than that, that's all I have. So please come visit us in the archives and see what we have on display. We have things on display. And uh, like I always say, please donate things you find in your closets and your attics because we need that stuff. Steve? Your genealogy class. Oh, and anyone who would like to come, um, starting my genealogy classes back up, this is Due to COVID, we're probably on our 11th year of doing those classes. I do once a month for free, and it's going to be June 22nd at the Houston County Library at 5.30. So anyone's welcome to come. And that's it. Well, in keeping with our 150th anniversary theme, it seems like Melissa may have a couple of uh, meeting programs in her works for Rachel Maddox or for Woodsville Christensen. Uh, to, to back up a little bit for you, uh, the board of directors as it stands now will be Dan Osbrooks, Jackie Bateman, Gary Booker, Benetta James, Mitchell Smithy, Rodney Lowe, and Kay French. The officers I have agreed to continue as president, Jerry Bobby, vice president, Melissa Barker, secretary, and Leah as our treasurer. In keeping with our theme or our joint meeting tonight, Ski, would you like to say anything on behalf of the Stewart County Historical Society? Well, she asked if I was the president of it. I said I am not. And I won't be because I don't want to be. But I am the vice president, acting president, because Brenda Lewis' husband's been still, so she hasn't been able to do it. But I've been taking care of her stuff too, with her help and everything. But um, last year we were supposed to host a joint meeting. Well, it got canceled, of course. So I just figured we weren't going to have one this year because of COVID, also. So 
I went ahead and scheduled a meeting for our normal time, which is the 22nd of June this time. Is that right? That doesn't sound right to me. No. That's about That's not right. I should have looked it up, but it's the last Tuesday of the month, maybe. But anyway, um, I can tell you what it's going to be, and you're all are more than welcome to come to it, but I already had it scheduled when they said that y'all were having a joint meeting, so we're going to do both. If you want to come to both of them, you can. Uh, it's... 29th. Okay. Okay, it's 29th then. I knew that didn't sound right. But um, it's going to be Dan Dill, who's a local guy, music teacher. He's going to talk about the history of the state songs. And there's several songs. Instead of just one state song, there's several. So that's what, he, that's what the program's going to be. And we will have snacks and stuff too, so... Just might want to let us know how many people might want to come. That might help. Just come on anyway. We, we always have enough, and if not, we'll go get some more. But um, we've got a few other programs. There's something new at the historical site right now. I got a, uh, it's, it's, it's mine. I had it made by a, a local student, a uh, diorama of Fort Henry. So it's something good. You might want to come look at it. I'll probably use it in some of my programs places later on, but it's on their display right there now. So I guess that's all I know. Anything else? I, I got one thing. Yes, sir. Brenda Lewis, sir. President. She's got shingles right now. And they're not they're hurting her. Okay, you may have wondered why we're meeting here. Um, the Erin City Hall is going to go under renovation. They tell them it could be any time. Their offices will be moved to the meeting rooms. Therefore, they don't need us in their meeting rooms. So we may be jumping around to have our meetings. So just watch for your email. Give me a call. Anybody um, that might know where we're going to meet, if you'd let us know. Um, we'll steer you in the right direction. We do have Phil Brown scheduled for our July meeting. And he will talk on the Cumberland City Rock Quarry. Is that correct, Donald? Right. Okay. Correct. And so our speaker tonight is Mr. Jim Long. His topic is the formation of Houston County. Did you know? Now, Jim probably doesn't need to be introduced to anybody in Stewart or Houston County, but um, his resume would uh, probably fill up pages and pages. And we're very lucky to have him. And welcome to Jim Long. We'll figure out where to put me in the microphone. And some of y'all may need to figure out where to put your foot. Thank you all for the invitation. I was here five years ago, actually, in my last presentation about our friend Jack Kinson. And before I get started on this, I thought I would just give you a little brief tantalizing update on our friend Mr. Jack Kinson. Some of you all may know about a channel on TV called The Outdoor Channel, or a show on that channel called Shooting USA. And a couple months ago, film crew from Shooting USA went down to Jack Henson's cave in the name bluff to film some footage and talk about the cave. Uh, Mr. Terry O'Neill Sykes hosted down there, and then they came to the Stewart County Archives. And after the cutting room floor stuff is done, I might be on camera for a minute or two talking about what we have found at the Stewart County Archives in relation to him. They haven't yet notified me when that program may air, but if you know about that show or know about that channel, just uh, keep an eye out for it. I think the story is going to be about the gun, with a little bit of a few minutes about the guy, but mostly about the gun. So, just wanted to mention that to you. It's great to be here again. I appreciate the information or the invitation. Um, what I'm going to be sharing tonight was inspired by Deborah's January video that you prepared on the actual anniversary of the 150th and some of the remarks you made there about the border dispute. 
And I had known a little bit about it, but I kind of wanted to just jump into it and say, uh, well, what's the detail? What drama happened? What comedy happened during all of that? You know, I wanted to look at uh, some of the records that we have at the Stewart County Archives that might add to the story and just kind of tell that story, peel back another layer of the onion and hopefully get you some information that maybe you didn't know. I certainly didn't know all of this. So I appreciate the inspiration from Deborah and her remarks in January. So I'm going to show you some records that I found in Stewart County Archives. I'll show you some of your own records that you already <laughs> have seen. I went to TSLA a couple of times to pull some things and I'll show you that. And I'll make, uh, make one, one trip to a cemetery that I'll talk about as well. Um, one of the things I have heard, and I haven't studied this until now, but there's, to me, I, it, it sounded like there had always been a, a little bit of a mystery about what the county was named, who the county was named for, where is the documentation, where is the proof. And, and the best I could do, just not knowing who had done what before, is just finding some newspaper clippings, and I think Nina had included one or, or both of these in uh, some of the things that she wrote, but you know, the credit goes to Squire John McMillan for coming up with the name, and there in the Nashville paper in May of 1871, you know, they say, Sam Houston is who the guy who was named for. Later that year, the Tobacco Leaf and Clarksville all hail to the, to the uh, proud son of Tennessee. So that was just a little fun thing to see. I had hoped beyond hope that there might be something hidden at the state archives that would be like a, a transcript of how, the, how everything went down, but that just didn't happen. Okay, it's 1870. How do you form a new county? Tennessee had just rewritten its constitution. Um, made a few changes, but basically to get a new county you had to have at least 275 square miles, um, a certain number of voters. You can't, can't be any closer to an existing courthouse than 11 miles, and you can't take away from an existing county to get them under 500 square miles. So those were the rules. The previous limits, were, which were in the 1836 Constitution, was that you couldn't be within 12 miles of a courthouse and you couldn't reduce a parent county to less than 625 miles. So in 1870, they kind of relaxed the rules a little bit, made it a little easier to form counties. And as Deborah said, in 1871, there were a bunch of counties that came in with these relaxed rules. So on May 7th, 1870, organizational meeting at Erin, I show you a partial Clarksville tobacco leaf clipping that only part of it survived. But General Quarles from Clarksville, who was a Lawyer, judge, House of Representatives veteran came down to offer his assistance. He basically explained what I just showed you on what it took to form a new county. Uh, the people that met formed a committee on surveying and started raising money on uh, getting the county surveyed. Uh, There's special support, special training, I guess, to bring General Paul's from Clarksville. So this committee, they uh, nominated, as you can see at the bottom of the clipping, John McMillan as the chairman of this committee. And that committee started working with the local state representative, W.A. West, who was the state representative for Stewart County. And what that committee came up with is a county that looked like that. So the arcs, of course, as we know, are can't get within 11 miles of Waverly, you can't get within 11 miles of Dover, but they got as close to 11 miles as they could in Stewart County. They uh, had to have 275 miles per the Constitution that was recently passed. It was claimed this was 340 square miles. It only measures out to 243 square miles, so we got a constitutional problem before the get-go. But they didn't let that stop them. W.A. West introduced House Bill 513 uh, to establish the county of Houston. The picture I show you on the left is uh, the House Journal and on the right is a page from that that I'll talk about in a minute. But the journal is fuzzy intentionally because I want you to see that beautiful new reading room at the Tennessee State Library and Archives. It is a beautiful, beautiful building and uh, just beyond my imagination. So if you haven't had a chance to go to that new archives and see that beautiful new reading room, it's tax dollars very well spent. Okay, House Bill 513 by Representative West went through three readings very quickly in the span of four days, really no issues there. 
On third reading, as it says, the bill as amended passed its third reading. Representatives voting aye, 56 to 1. One person voted against this thing. When you see something like that, you got to think, okay, who was this guy? What's his story? Well, I'll tell you. Hamner King was the representative for Madison County, Jackson. He was a liquor dealer, operated saloons, big businessman. He was a veteran of Forest Cavalry, term as mayor of Jackson, so he's a mover shaker, but way over in Madison County. I don't know what his beef was about forming Houston County. But uh, here's his tombstone in Jackson, and to uh, remind him and remind everyone else um, of uh, the anniversary taking place here, if you go visit his tombstone, I've made a little modification to it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the House bill passed 56 to 1, and then had to go to the Senate. Now, in the Senate, they added four amendments because they knew the county was short on my acreage. So they added section 17 to 20 to include the little corner of Montgomery County, just enough. 32 square miles to get them up to the 275 constitutional minimum. Okay, we got our 275 square miles. Let's go for this thing. Let's vote in the Senate. Pass 20 to 3. Three guys in the Senate say no. Well, who are these guys? Okay, Eason, he was the state senator representing Dixon County. Okay, that kind of makes sense. He was being affected by this new county. We'll give him some slack on that. Dorsey Thomas, the Speaker of the House, of the Senate, was from Humphreys County, okay, another county that stood to lose in the new county. And the third guy, questionable Emerson Etheridge, he was the state senator for Henry County. I don't know, if they didn't stand anything to lose. They were across the river, but he voted no. But anyway, it passed, 20 to 3. So now that we have House bill passed, Senate bill passed, it's time to let the people vote. So February 22nd, 1871 was the referendum. I show you a list on the left of where the polls were located in Stewart, Humphreys, Dixon, and Montgomery counties. In bold, a special uh, shout out to Keziah Vickers on Hurricane Creek. She's my ancestor. And I've never found that cemetery, so if you know where the Vickers family cemetery is on Hurricane Creek, or more likely the barn, one of the many barns family cemeteries on Hurricane Creek. Okay, so February 22nd, Stewart says, let's do it. Dixon says, let's do it. Humphrey says, let's do it. Montgomery says, nah, I don't think so. But they still had the majority they needed to pass the referendum. And so with the exception of that little section of Montgomery County that was added, we've got Houston County up ready to go. It's time to vote for officers. March 17th, St. Patrick's Day, 1871, was the first election. And there on the left are the winners of those first election. The national paper on the right covered a list of all the candidates and who received one vote. What I love about this article, if you've ever wondered whether your ancestor from Houston County ran for office, this article says almost everybody in the new county was a candidate for office. <laughs> so Houston County Court, uh, based on this vote, these officers being elected first met on April 3rd. Now, one thing I did find interesting about getting this county up and running, and I believe it was Nina's, uh, one of her histories, but made the statement that no criminal cases were transferred from Stewart County to the new county, and the implication there is all the criminals stayed in the old county, <laughs> just good people in, in Houston. Well, it's not entirely true. I found two cases, and i show you the pages from the Stewart County uh, Criminal Circuit Court Minute Book, April 10, 1871, the case of State versus, versus R.A. Salisbury and others for a nuisance was transferred to Houston County, and State versus William Davis for larceny was also transferred to, to, to Houston County. So two criminal cases, not zero, transferred. But the case against William Davis was this. 1870, no Houston County yet, so this took place in what was then Stewart, he feloniously took, stole, and carried away a coat, a vest, a shirt, and a pocket purse belonging to G.M. Dennison. So that came up. This is the Houston Circuit Court Minute Book. But the Attorney General dropped this case without prosecuting it. So 
we cut that guy some slack. We're down to one criminal transferred over. But the other case, R.A. Salisbury and others for nuisance, was uh, quashed, the indictment was quashed before he ever came to trial. R.A. Salisbury was the owner operator of the Eureka Lime Works at Stewart. And we don't know what the nuisance was, but it was quashed. So we'll say, okay, I agree, zero criminals in the new county from Stewart. We've got the county up and running. We've got officers elected. There's a wonderful article in the Nashville paper in May of 1871 about the new county. Lots of great information in there. If you haven't seen it, uh, go seek it out. What really jumped out at me was to talk about the Wells Creek Basin. I had no idea that they knew that early, you know, what was going on with that basin. And there's a lot of geological detail in this article about that basin. But one thing jumped out at me about that is they said the center of the basin has been elevated by subterranean forces. So they thought it was something that pushed up from below instead of something that came down from below. But still a fascinating thing to read. Okay, we've got a great new county, no criminals, we've got our officers elected, county court is up and running, Stewart County says, not so fast. On April 3rd, 1871, which is the same day that Houston County Court first met, Houston County says we've been cheated. They've appointed a committee to run a line between the new counties to see if Stewart has lost before it's constitutionally mandated 500 square miles and make sure that that new line doesn't come within 11 miles of Dover. So they have hired W.M. Shelton Jr. of Clarksville as a surveyor to run the boundaries and uh, make sure the 500 square miles, 11 miles away from Dover. And he files a report, and that report is in the June 1871 Will Book, uh, Will Book K. I don't know why they wrote it in the Will Book, but that's where they put it. And what that commission, and these are all Stewart County people, they find that Houston County approaches closer than 11 miles to Dover in an airline, we would say as the crow flies, and leaves Stewart short about 45 square miles. So in the will book, there is a very, very detailed description of the survey of Stewart County that would uphold the constitutional 500 square miles and don't get 11 miles closer than Dover. And the shape that it describes is this, which is exactly the county today, 500 square miles, and the same borders that we know today. So in 1871, this is what Stewart County said, this is what we want. This is what should have happened. But they're a long way from getting there. Um, I love the survey crew that they hired in 1871 filed an expense report immediately following the survey that they printed out. And to give you an idea of what, what they paid, uh, the surveyor himself, 18 days, he got five bucks a day. Chain carriers only got a dollar a day. Uh, there was room and board, Mrs. Norris. Mrs. Norris was uh, famous in Stewart County for murdering her husband and getting acquitted. <laughs> and then she had also been famous as a Civil War spy. Um, ferry tolls getting across the river for the survey. There was a fancy dinner at Blue Spring. Dinner normally cost a dollar, dollar fifty. At Blue Spring, it cost two dollars. Mrs. Cook's night's lodging that was four bucks all its own, and that didn't include dinner. So I don't know what all was involved in it at Mrs. Not Cook's. Not and my favorite, cheese and crackers, forty cents. <laughs> so it cost the county two hundred dollars to have this survey done. And the paper uh, next month in Clarksville picks up and says. We learned from the Dover paper that the survey that's been redone, uh, Cumberland City is still part of Stewart County, according to that survey. Now, the boundary dispute is just getting started, but another part of forming a new county is that the new county has to take part of the debt that the old county may have had, bond issues and whatnot. So Stewart County wasted no time in dumping indebtedness on Houston County, July 3rd, they appoint commissioners to meet with Houston County and get the indebtedness pushed over to Houston County, have them have to pay their part of it. What I don't know is how much of it did they push? Did they push based on the boundary they thought should have been done or the boundary that was done? Don't know, but they wasted no time trying to uh, further screw Houston County. <laughs> 
and at the same court, July 3rd, 1871, Stewart County Court, appointed P.T. Waffer as a tax assessor to go into that strip of disputed land, write it down in his book, and collect it. So Stewart County is saying, we're going to collect the taxes in this disputed area, even before this is all settled. Humphreys County kind of jumps into the fray, too, in October. They say, we want to sue also. But in uh, Houston County's court minutes, they say that this proposition for a compromise be met in a friendly spirit. So whereas Stewart's coming at them with both guns blazing, Houston County wants to treat Humphreys County with a more friendly spirit. The dispute here with Humphreys was similar to Stewart in that they thought the new line was too close to Waverly. The paper picks up on this and says the denizens of Houston are not afraid of the consequences of the suits instituted by Stewart and Humphreys, who also act as if determined to conquer or die. Okay, so November of 71, in Chancery Court in Dover, the lawsuit for the border dispute gets fired up. Dunbar versus McKinnon is how it was styled because those were the chairman of the county courts and Stewart and Houston counties. The Chancery Court decided that a competent surveyor, W.M. Shelton Sr., be appointed to resurvey. This is Sr., who was the father of the guy that did the first survey, <laughs> ate cheese and crackers. I don't know if the competent meant that the first guy was thought to be incompetent, but they're appointing Sr., who had been a Montgomery County Sheriff and Montgomery County Surveyor for a long time, to do this new survey. Uh, trying to find out if Stewart County, with the line drawn by the legislature still had at least 500 miles. And I thought it interesting that they stipulated so as to include LaGrange Furnace. So Stewart County was saying, whatever happens, we want to keep LaGrange Furnace. Stewart County in this lawsuit said, we really don't care if the line comes closer to than 11 miles to Dover as long as we get our 500 miles back. And if we're right, Houston County has to pay for the survey. The papers announced, oh, it's all been compromised, amicably adjusted. I don't think so. I've seen no evidence that Cumberland City gave up her claims to the territory. So I think the paper kind of jumped the gun here on declaring it to be compromised. However, in Houston County Court, they did ratify the compromise. The agreement to resurvey is the compromise. And they named people to represent Houston County in that resurvey. There had been no decision about what the boundary will be, but they've agreed to sponsor the resurvey. Stewart County gets antsy. They asked A.B. Ross to correspond with Mr. Shelton to find out when is he going to start the survey. And three weeks later, he actually did start the survey, and it began on January 22, 1872. It lasted for 33 days. And what they came up with as the what would leave the borders of Houston County was something that looked kind of like that. <laughs> they started at the northwest corner of Houston County, uh, just below Hurricane Creek, about where the boundary is now, and went down to Tennessee to Kentucky, across to Montgomery County, down to, Montgomery, to almost the southwest corner of Montgomery County, you can see they didn't quite get down to the corner because Mr. Shelton said, if you stop right before you get to the corner and then just go due west back to the beginning, that leaves Stewart County with 500 square miles. No big deal. But he also says, we adjourned in consequence of the inclemency of the weather. So they only went to that point. They didn't finish the survey. They didn't finish that west line back to the Tennessee River. And Shelton says, nah, that's 500 miles. We're good. <laughs> Houston County's reaction was not quite so favorable. April of 72, they said the line had not been completed and that the compromise had been made by the attorneys of the two counties. So Houston County's unimpressed by this re-survey. They ordered the attempted compromise to be annulled and they are assuming full jurisdiction and control of the county as set forth by the legislature. So Stewart County says they're going to collect taxes. Houston County says we're operating as if that is what we have. The original uh, survey or, uh, according to the legislature. While I was looking for 
this level of detail, I did find in one of our minute books, this little slip of paper from May of 1872 was a certificate. It's a little fuzzy, but the commissioners for Stewart County resurveying were certifying that the chain carriers were due $4.50, but they didn't yet know how to spell Houston, H-U-G-H-S-T-O-N. I like that. So Houston County decides we need a resurvey with our own guy that we pick, not that Shelton senior or junior. And so they get J.P. Ta Tapscott, who was also from Clarksville, to rerun the survey. And the paper says we hope our, our neighbors sort it all out. However, back in Chancery Court in Dover, the chancellor affirms the first Shelton survey, Shelton Jr., uh, which is basically the borders we have today, orders Houston County to pay for it. Houston County says, nope, we're going to the Supreme Court. We don't like that ruling. So while we're waiting on the Supreme Court to weigh in on all of this, and there's a bit of mystery about that, Stewart County, April of 73, says, we want an attorney to go stop Houston County from collecting taxes north of the Shelton line that we like. January of 74, they do it again. We want an attorney to go stop them from collecting taxes in the disputed area. And again, April of 74, repeat the instructions to the attorney, go collect the taxes in the disputed area, but hold on to them until we hear back from the Supreme Court. Now, while they're waiting on the Supreme Court, our first, our second surveyor, Mr. William Shelton Sr., the one who didn't finish his survey, died. And his poor, bereaving widow, Mrs. Ann Shelton, comes to Stewart County to get her husband's payment for doing that survey. But Stewart County refused to make the appropriation to the poor widow Shelton. They're just really playing hardball here. Houston County Court in October of 75 appoints commissioners to offer a compromise. And at the next county court in Stewart County, Stewart County refuses to entertain the proposition. So this is where, for me at least, part of the doubt, mystery, vagueness comes in because I never actually found the Supreme Court case. I went twice to the state archives looking for Dunbar versus McKinnon, Elliott versus McKinnon because he was a chair of Houston versus Stewart, Stewart versus Houston, Thought I'd find it in docket books, minute books, judges' opinions, nothing. I just didn't find it. And I don't understand that. I don't like it. I'm not happy with it. <laughs> That's what happened. But it appears that whatever the Supreme Court did had happened by July of 1876. Because Stewart County Court ordered the southern part of its county, everything south of Cumberland River, to be redistricted and they created a new District 12 that went down to the Houston line to include all of that part of Stewart County on Hurricane Creek. And that's describing the border that we know today because Hurricane Creek is in both counties. And so it seems by 1876, the Supreme Court has, they've heard back from the Supreme Court and it seems at least in Stewart County's opinion that this, which is the current border, is what the compromise was. Meanwhile, Stewart County is still playing hardball. April of 1878, Judge Lurton out of Clarksville comes and asks for $100 more for everything he did for Stewart County. And Stewart County rejects that request, saying, hey, we won the suit. Houston County has to pay for the survey. Houston County, good people down here, April of 79, orders Chancery Court to pay Judge Lurton $91 that Stewart County should have paid. As I said before, the Supreme Court case is really a big mystery. Um, I don't understand why I couldn't find any mention of it in the books, and I'll figure that out eventually. Um, but maybe that's part of why people around one or both counties were confused as well, because in 1907, the Houston County Court orders a new survey. And they appoint commissioners and to work with Stewart make the survey and share the expenses. So that was July of 1907. They were to meet on December 2nd, 1907 at what I call, my words, the meeting at the stomp. 
Here's a picture of a stump, it's not the stump. But Houston County's position was that a certain stump was the corner between Stewart and Houston counties at the eastern end. And Stewart County was having none of it. They said, we don't believe that's the corner, that's not it. So they ran a line from that stump north up to the Cumberland River and it didn't measure out the same distance that the, the compromise line had called for. So they went from the river south to where the corner should be and ran the line west and it was way short, way short on, on acreage for uh, Stewart County. So they just decided that, um, well, let me just show you, yeah. So they, it, roughly this, they came pretty far north from the Bermond County corner and due west, and they came out almost to Leatherwood Creek, which was not the right corner. So they said, this can't be right. So then they went back over east to the Montgomery County line, and the Stewart County guys proposed to remeasure start not from the stump, but where from Shelton's original survey was close to the Montgomery County corner. And the Houston County guys said, nah, we're not into that. And they basically walked away from the survey in December of 1907. So things are still happening in the courts, trying to get the survey recertified or figure out what did the Supreme Court say or do. And then Fast forward to 1909, the Clarksville paper says, oh, voila, we magically found a decision that the Supreme Court had rendered in 1872 by Justice Peter Turney, and I could not find that decision as hard as I've tried. And the paper reports that the matter ends with the county line exactly where it was, which is where it is today. Uh, the commission, some of the older old timers in the county said, that thing was settled a long time ago, you didn't know that. The Supreme Court basically confirmed what we know today is the county line. But just to make sure, even though there were supposedly records that I was not able to find saying the line then is where it is now, they did run through the House and the Senate a new act in 1909 that says, you know, for a number of years doubts had existed about where the line really was between Stewart and Houston. And so they resurveyed and they put, the, put it to an act. And they even mentioned here a Supreme Court decision in 1896 that I couldn't find either. This is a real mystery to me. So if you're up to the challenge and you want an excuse to go to the new state archives, help me go figure out where all these Supreme Court records that they refer to from 1872 and 1890, 1896. So the result of that act in 1909 was basically the Houston County that we know today. And that's what I have to share tonight. I hope you've uh, enjoyed it into your noggin, and I would appreciate any questions that you may have. I have a question. Um, you said that the county line was the courthouse. Why did they want to do county? Part. Yes. That's the best I have come yeah. up with too, is that it was too far to get yeah. to Dover or Waverly, depending on where they were living. I would love to have known when the first meeting was and who was there that said, we need a new county. Yeah. You know, yeah. they could have been around a table having a cup of coffee. Right. Well, there was, you know, who was there at the first meeting? There was that partial newspaper clipping uh, that had some of the names. You know, there was an informal meeting at some point at a saloon or right. somewhere. Yeah, this thing right here has a list of the committee members on the yeah. committee on survey. So they were some of the, the people, and they were people from each county. But yeah, how did they get pulled into this? Oh, yeah, we didn't right, yeah. yeah, I just had a question. How were the taxes collected? And also, uh, the people that were in the disputed territory, were there any instances or stories of saying, no, I'm not going to pay this because I'm in Houston County? Right, so the taxes, uh, the justice of the pieces for the justices of the peace for the counties were the ones assigned to collect the taxes in their respective districts. So it was their job to knock on door to door, make out a list, they'd use last year's list, and collect. And there were receipts involved when you paid your taxes, you got a receipt. In Stewart County, we don't have any tax receipts to kind of answer that question of, in that disputed area, who who did you, did you give your money to? 
I have seen a few cases that they said that particular guy doesn't have to pay his taxes to us because there's evidence he paid it to the other county. But I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to the question on who did they pay. Where, where did Houston County get its seed money to pay the very first bills? Where did Houston County get its tax, seed money tax, to pay tax its bills? Tax paid it a year later. So right. They've been... That's a great question. I, I don't know. I don't know where they got their initial funds to get up and running. I, there was nothing in the Constitution that said the parent counties had to chip in. So maybe well, there was an appropriation by the state legislature. I, 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 I think you're right on that. Once they did that, you had the property who had paid for one county, it could have been, I think it was assessed to transfer the property from one county to But if the counties were disputing who, who owned the land, I, if I were steward, I'm probably not going to send the, my money to Houston for somebody that I think lives in my county. So maybe a state appropriation got the new counties funded. I can say that in Houston County in the archives, we have the, uh, the very first warrants. And if you don't know what warrants are, they're essentially checks. We have the check stubs from 1871 from where they paid surveyors, they paid people to start everything in Houston County. We have those intact and I've got them indexed by the person. It doesn't county. show any income, just the expenses? It shows the expenses. The warrant shows expenses. A great question. One of our ancestors, I guess he would have been our what, great great grandfather, uh, was one of the surveyors. We saw his name in one of the articles then. But I, I always heard that he was given land for the survey. He and another guy was supposed to have been the ones that surveyed these together. Paid for, paid for the survey with land. I, I, no. I personally doubt it. I don't think it's a county, I think. I, I yeah. But I think he done more of the Humphreys County side. Yeah, but they would have been, I think they would have just been paid yeah. cash or vouchers yeah. rather than actual land, because the land by this time is pretty much all claimed. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't think there would have been vacant land to get it. So in our records, of our family, we have the Humphreys County Survey Board, and well, there are three parent counties for Houston. Stewart was the biggest, but you also had Hume, Humphreys and Dixon, so depending on what part of the county they lived in, you may have, you know, go to that archive instead of that county. Uh, for the Wells Creek case, I think mean, it's 1869. Uh, Safford's geological report identifies it, so it's fairly recent news. Okay, so 1869 is the first analysis of the basin that's recorded. He's got a map as well that's included in that geological report and it shows the Wells Creek Basin. So did Safford say it was a thrust up? I don't recall. Um, they know it's a, yeah, I believe so, but I don't think he uh, necessarily qualifies as to how it yeah. came out. This, this seems like a stupid question, but did they know about meteorites in 1870? <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't Vanderbilt University have a pretty extensive uh, study on Wells Creek from the uh, geological study up there? I believe I, I, don't, I don't know. They do. Um, we also have uh, a, a lot of documentation and, and reports and surveys and things in the archives in Houston County. Because it's here, and so there's been a lot. Of, I've had students come to do their thesis on it and stuff, and they've used those records. What about Cumberland City? Where did, what, what was their role during the decision? Did they, they always want to be in strict or did I, I didn't research that, and the newspapers don't survive well from that period to tell us kind of the voice of the people. Where did Cumberland City want to be? Did they want to be in Stewart? Did they want to be in Houston? So I, I don't know the answer of what they wanted. We know Stewart County wanted Cumberland City. 
I don't know what the residents wanted. They they voted. Well, would they have, yeah, they they were in the area that would have been subject to vote, so they got to vote. These people all or all the people that got to vote, including the Montgomery County Coroner, so the people that voted in that area voted more than two thirds in favor of forming a new county. So you could kind of guess that Cumberland City generally was in favor of going with the new county. They were, what, 12, 13 miles from Dover? And so at that time, was Cumberland City or Bowling Green, which whatever it was called, a thriving community, really? Uh -huh. Yeah, so yeah great, great, great conversation. Really wanted to keep that income coming in. Yeah, yeah. And maybe, maybe why, well, I don't know. But I, th I think the reason Cumberland City was included was primarily because they needed the acreage. They needed to make that 275 square miles to even have the chance of a new county. Have you, have you talked to TSLA about the Supreme Court records? Have I talked to TSLA about Supreme Court records? No. Have you talked to the research for that? Have you talked to, is this Tom? Tom, Tom Cannon, yeah. I have not yet talked to an expert on the Supreme Court records there um, to see why couldn't I find this thing? Yeah. I, best I can guess is that even though the case started out being called Dunbar versus McKinnon, it by the time it went to the Supreme Court, it was in some different name that I just didn't. I was looking in the D's and the indexes for Dunbar, or H's for Houston, or S's for Stewart, and I just didn't find it. It's it's got to be there somewhere. The records survive really well oh, yeah. from the Supreme Court. Any guess as to what kind of tree that is? The stump that, that stump, okay, that's just a, the stump is just a picture I found on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it's in New England, I think. It's a, it's a cedar. What's and the I, what's the real stump supposed to be? <laughs> well, I don't. Um, Historic County Park. I, you know, I don't know if I, I don't think I have a, a detail of what all the different calls for the border of the county was, but it was probably a black oak. They were corner trees very often. Yeah. Give me a chestnut oak too. I, you don't see chestnut oaks used as corner trees all that often for whatever reason. You see black oaks and white oaks a lot. Um, it's a cedar. It's a really big cedar. And it's, I think, up in New England. Actually, the well, you can't see it. There's actually a, it says on the picture where it is, but I can't read it. Was Erin already started? Was Erin already started? Yes. Erin, okay. but when the railroad was built, you had Erin yes. and Stewart and uh, you know, all the stations along the way, Bowling Green. Where were the original lines before East County was started? Where were the original lines? Um, the best answer, if I could just exit this and show you the 1865 map. Uh, it's not even on there. Let me just go open the map. If you haven't heard me talk about this map, you're about to. It's the best map ever. <laughs> this is on the wall of the archives. It's um. It's it's at the National Archives in Washington, in Greenbelt, Maryland, actually. And um, it, it's covered most of Middle Tennessee. It's called the 1865 map of Middle Tennessee. Okay. Um, all right. To get your bearings, you see the red. The red is the railroad, and I can't tell if that's in focus or not. But here. Ridge, Stewart, Vanville, and the hatched line is the county line. So White Oak Creek, the county line between Stewart and Humphreys crossed White Oak and then came up here and kind of followed White Oak over a point and then here's the county line all the way over to Dixon. So that was the Stewart Humphreys county line in 1865. And who did that? This map was made by the Union Army, 
If you look closely at it, a lot of things are misspelled because they didn't know how to spell their names. But it's, it's also a map because it has landowner names on it. Um, and this map, um, if you've not seen it before and you want to know where to find it, just come see me afterwards because it's a free download off of my website. And you can zoom in on it. Well, is the battle still going on? Is the battle still going on? I think there have been some recent grumblings about some tax issues in the industrial part. So in part, maybe it's still going on. Thank you all for the invitation. much that was very interesting um, I wanted to say too that since we uh, did not have food for you all tonight I have bottled water in the uh, cooler back there and we have freshly picked mulberries for you to try if you've never tried a mulberry the stem is not to be eaten but they're good to hold on to the berry with so try them Greg Reynolds brought those freshly picked from Stuart, right on me, Stuart, Houston. <laughs> Thank you. I got one other thing. Okay. The Stuart County School of Society meeting is on the fourth Tuesday, and it's the 22nd. <laughs> That's the same thing. Stuart County has Brenda Lewis and Houston County. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry. I have an announcement that I brought some pictures got from the National Archive of Danville, and they're in this book over here, and they're numbered. And uh, there's like probably 250 pictures that we bought from the National Archive of Danville. From, and like I told Ski, that they have them from Stewart County, Bend County, Humphreys County. And the reason I found it is because of the cemetery they were moving from Reynoldsburg to Hill Orchard and, come, and you know, Tennessee River down by Wild. But there's, the pictures are over there if anybody wants to look at them. They're neat pictures. And if anybody wants any of the 150 dollars a day from Santa Clara, I'll get the money over there. Okay, maybe it's your turn. Thank you for having us. Thank you.